the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This past week, I spoke with a friend about what I wanted to focus on in this sermon and what I was thinking about when I was reading this passage. It's full of vivid details with an adulterous political ruler, a calculating woman, a young dancing girl, court intrigue, and a violent end. While I was talking through all of these details about John the Baptist's death with my friend, she said, just speak about Jesus. That's what John would want. <laughs> she said it somewhat flippantly, but she was right. The story is about Jesus, and talking about him is what John would have wanted. The Gospel of Mark actually begins with this phrase, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But then it cuts straight to John the Baptist, not Jesus. At that point, John seems to be in his prime. He has whole crowds traveling into the wilderness to hear him speak and be baptized. John claims enough authority to baptize people and assure them of their forgiveness, but he always follows it up with a promise. He is not the end-all, be-all. John is one in a line of messengers, sent to announce that the long-awaited Lord is coming, and he's coming with more than baptismal water. He's coming with the Holy Spirit. As he's preaching and baptizing, John doesn't shy away from his calling and the authority he has over whole crowds, but neither does he confuse his own work with the magnitude of the coming saviors. Somewhat ironically, by acknowledging an authority greater than himself, John actually gains freedom. He becomes free to live into God's call on his life, which can only happen after a person recognizes God's power in their life. That type of freedom becomes clearer and it becomes more apparent when we compare John's motivations with Herod's motivations. Herod is a ruler in Galilee during the time of Jesus' ministry, so he is one of the political elite. In our passage, Mark calls Herod king, but that's actually not quite right. Herod wanted to be king, but his reach far exceeded his actual grasp. His attempts to be crowned actually got him banished by Rome, and then given the title of Tetrarch, meaning one of four other rulers. His political power and his social standing depended on nothing more than Rome's whim, and was not a result of his own political prowess. So when Mark calls him king, it could be a mistake, or it could be him mocking the ruler. Like, sure, King Herod was there. Still, when John condemns Herod's marriage outright, Herod has power enough to arrest John and keep him in prison indefinitely. As we've already heard, the problem with Herod's marriage is that it was born out of adultery with his half-brother's wife. In a vivid series of events, Herod, the manipulator, actually finds himself backed into a corner, where he thinks that he only has one option, to order an execution against his own personal wishes. Though at first glance he's the most powerful person in this passage, he's actually the weakest. Herod, for all of his grabs of power, still isn't free. I said that I would talk about Jesus, so here's what I think is particularly important. A fundamental difference between John and between Herod <coughs> is where they think authority resides. For John, the authority is Jesus. For Herod, the authority is himself, or so he likes to think. I've already mentioned that John knew he wasn't the end-all, be-all, because there's a powerful savior on the move. By the end of the passage, Herod also realizes that he's not the final authority, but it is a rude awakening. Remember, Herod actually wanted to protect John. For him, John is an enigmatic figure that made him both afraid and perplexed, and he still enjoyed listening to him. It's his wife, Herodias, who wanted John dead. Herod could have actually heeded John's advice, divorced his wife, with little practically speaking to lose. But Herodias, as a woman at that time, would have lost everything. She wouldn't have shown up to her ex-husband's door expecting to be taken in, nor was there any social safety net for her to fall back on to regain her footing. Getting John out of the picture meant security for her. So she becomes master manipulator, using Herod's approval of his daughter to protect herself. And there was King Herod perhaps thinking that offering up to half his kingdom will be a show of his power and control, but that very offer is what traps him and 
reveals him as someone whose authority is the kind that gives orders to keep from bruising his pride. The result is, of course, John's arrest and execution. By the way, one of my personal sort of guiding theological principles is that God is not needy. God doesn't need John to be arrested and executed for the gospel to be spread. But I think that stories with this kind of manipulation and violence tell us far more about ourselves than they do about God. What we see in this story are two different people with two different ways of dealing with the fact that they don't have the final say. Both men can recognize they are not the end-all be-all, but that means that some other person or thing or system has to be. I think the story with all of the dramatic details actually leads us to ask, who has authority in our lives? Who do we think Jesus is to begin with? Not only who we think Jesus should be, or how Jesus has been described to us in the past, though either of those may be a part of our answer. Giving an answer isn't easy. Sometimes our attitude toward Jesus is hidden or implicit, because it's kind of more of a heart thing, not only a matter of mental assent. One way to start reflecting on this is to start noticing a few things throughout our daily lives. We can ask ourselves, how often do we talk or think about Jesus? Who do we talk about God with? And what is our affect, our emotions, or our attitude when we do so? There could be as many different answers as there are people in this room, but it's a way to begin reflecting on who has authority in our own lives. Recognizing God with that kind of power actually enables us to relativize other authorities and help us discern how to act. We can see this in our story as John first acknowledged Jesus' legitimate power and then made a very pointed critique of Herod's supposed power. You can't miss the political nature of this story. So clearly he's prioritizing. Whatever Herod can do to him will not scare him into submission, because the promised Savior already has his loyalty. Still, I know for myself, it can be difficult to talk about submitting to God, um, much less actually do it. It's difficult to embrace the topic when we've grown up with the ideals of individuality and self-sufficiency before all else. We might be wary of giving up our power because we have had other authority figures who have definitely let us down, or because whole social systems that symbolize authority, we've seen them corrupted. So for those who do struggle with this, I have one more thing to say about welcoming God's power into our lives. When we submit to the right authority, like God, we can actually grow into new forms of freedom. I know it sounds a bit counterintuitive at first, because to give someone authority in our lives also means they have the authority to put limitations in place. So surrender and freedom don't often come as a pair, but there are different types of freedom, both valuable. There is freedom from and freedom to. I think that when it comes to our own spirituality and its effects on our lives, we often need the freedom from before we experience the freedom to. So for example, we need freedom from our sin before we experience the freedom to live into God's call on our lives. I think this really, really raises the stakes. It means we can't experience the freedom without acknowledging the authority. But the good news is that freedom comes through that exact same process of embracing God. We may not be able to completely opt out of the relationships we have or the environments that we frequent. Clearly, John couldn't opt out of his own arrest. But he knew what the consequences might be, and he still chose the promised Savior over the so-called King. So when we ask ourselves, is God the final authority in our lives? Or what do we need freedom from so that we experience the freedom God wants for us? We have John as an exemplar of trust in God's power. Through the Gospels, his words and actions continue to prepare a way for the Lord among each one of us.